Good morning, Crossroads, and all who are joining in today. Thank you for being a part of our online service. Together, we'll share in worship and prayer and also hear the Word of God together. I trust it will be a time of blessing. It is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and as we continue our journey through Lent, we have much to pray about and to think about our walk with God and how we serve Him in these days. We continue to be under suspension, and we don't know when that will be lifted. Uh, things are changing daily and weekly in our region and across the country and, of course, around the world. Many churches will remain closed through Easter, and we don't know yet what the status will be for us. But please be praying about that, that we will be wise and will open well and in a safe way that continues to minister to the needs of those who are able to come and also as we continue online. So please be praying about that. And also we look forward to hearing from you um, of your preferences and your, uh, your thoughts about reopening. A few announcements in the bulletin. I just remind you about the World Day of Prayer that took place and there, it is available online and the details are there if you'd like to view it. Uh, the upcoming thrift store date is March 26, Friday, March 26. And those that are able to be a part of that, uh, please give Lil a call. Our AGM is coming up in April, April 25th, and we'll give you more details and then paperwork to go with that report of the last year. And please be in prayer as we look forward to where God is taking us in this year. We are updating our directory for Crossroads, and if you are in it or information has changed, please be sure to contact the office and update your information. If you are not wanting to be in it or you want something changed, again, please be in touch with admin and the phone and email are both listed there. Well, let's continue in our worship as we share together in the call to worship. Too often, too easily, our eyes are drawn down, O Lord, to the suffering of victims and the pain of perpetrators, to the wounds we inflict on others and the wounds we inflict on ourselves. We need to see these things and pray, but we also need our eyes to be lifted, O God, to the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls, to the cross that casts its liberating shadow, across all human affairs. We lift our eyes, O God, and we lift our hearts. Fill us with faith and hope and love. Amen. Amen. Well, let's join together in worship. We begin with, I will arise and go to Jesus, and he will embrace me in his arms. Then we continue with, Thou my everlasting portion, more than friend or life to me.
Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Father, merciful God, we pray for all Christians right here within our city, within our congregation, congregations across the land and around the world. Lord, help us to be that royal priesthood that you have called us to, a holy nation, to the praise of Christ our Savior. Help us, O God. We pray for Chuck and Carol today, a part of our congregation. We thank you for them, how they serve you and how they serve your church. Lord, involved with a facility and services and worship and prayer. Lord, we thank you for them, for their service, for their friendship, O Lord. And Lord, we pray your special blessing upon them today. O God, with health challenges, we pray for your healing touch. And in the midst of all, we pray for your grace. Continue to protect them and use them for your glory. We pray for our Bishop Cliff today and all pastors and, and ministers, O oh God, that they will remain faithful to their calling and, Lord, that your anointed would be rich in their lives as they proclaim the word of truth. We think of our own congregation, congregations around the city, and particularly we think of Grace Church today. We pray for Pastor Mark and others that serve with him. Lord, minister through them, O oh God, to your people, and, Lord, help them as they reach out to many across the city. We thank you. We pray for Elizabeth, our queen, for leaders of nations and all in authority, that your people may lead a quiet and peaceable life under their care. Lord, we pray for this city and all who live here, the poor, the rich, the elderly, the young, men and women. Lord, that you would show your goodwill to each one. We pray for victims, O oh God, and those who minister to them and those that help, O oh God, and we ask that you would also be their help and defense. We pray for so many amongst us, O oh Lord, who are sick and injured, with strokes and cancer and, and heart issues. O oh God, we just pray that you would reach down again and give strength, O oh Lord, and Lord, that you would heal. Thank you, O oh God, for care that they are receiving through our medical system. And Lord, we also pray again, for your healing touch, your strength, and again, grace in the midst of the situation. We think of all. Lord, we pray that even this day they would be strengthened in their faith, O God. For those that are new and those that have walked with, with you for many, many years, Lord, strengthen as they hear your word and continue in your word and in prayer on a daily basis. We give you all. Thanks for all the saints from earliest times. Today, as we look at the children of Israel in the wilderness, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to them. And Lord, we look back and we see prophets and apostles and martyrs and those whose names are known to you only. And we pray that we too may be counted among your faithful witnesses. We thank you for hearing our prayer today. Thank you, Lord, for your faithful people in giving their tithes and offerings. And Lord, we pray that you would bless, O God, and use these tithes and these offerings to bring glory and honor to you, to strengthen the saints, and to reach out to others that don't know you yet. Help us, O God. Thank you for each gift. Thank you for each giver. And in a few moments, as we look into the word, O God, we pray that you would speak to us through these pages. From the book of Numbers and the Gospel of John, Lord, help us to hear what you're speaking to us, O God. Encourage our hearts, challenge us, O Lord, as we serve you and as we serve others. We thank you as we continue in our worship, Lord. Receive our praise, receive our worship. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's continue in our worship and also in the word of God. We thank the Lord that he hears us as we pray. And where could we go but to the Lord with our struggles, with our problems, with our health issues? Where could we go but to the Lord?
Numbers 21 From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and every one who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. John chapter 3 And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Today we look into Numbers chapter 21 and we see the children of Israel in the wilderness. Over the years, God had kept them. They had had many struggles, but God showed them many miracles. They faced many enemies along the way, but God gave them victories. 
They were thirsty and God gave them water from a rock. They were hungry and God gave them manna, bread from heaven. They wanted to eat meat. And in the wind, God sent the quail so that they could eat meat. In this very chapter, Numbers 21, in the first few verses, we we hear of a great victory that Israel had over the Canaanites. And we catch up with them in verse 4, from Mount Hor, they set out by way of to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But something happened on the way. It says the people became impatient on the way. They had just enjoyed a victory. There had been excitement in their, in their camp, in their, in their group. But now they were impatient on the way. They were back to what we might call a normal life. They were back to the usual, the daily life, and they became impatient. They wanted something else. Another translation, it says, the the soul of the people became very discouraged. They were very discouraged in daily life. Their eyes were back to their common, ordinary, everyday, earthly existence. And they became impatient. They became discouraged. Are you discouraged? Have you been discouraged? And of course, discouragements come. Many things change in our lives. They change daily. And so many forces that we cannot control affect our lives. And just like the people of Israel, we become discouraged and sometimes impatient along the way. Impatient because we have expectations. We have an expectation of where God is taking us. And of course, we have that expectation and hopefully we have our eyes set on that heavenly prize. But the years that God gives us on this earth sometimes can be discouraging. Our sickness, health issues, economic issues, political issues, many things that affect us. COVID has affected us greatly in our nation and the nations of the world. And so easy it is to become impatient or discouraged. We're tired of a lockdown and and tired of, of constraints. And we become discouraged along the way. The psalmist asks, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your faith in God. And David cried from the pit. And he said, Lord, reach down and save me. And sometimes we, we are downcast. Sometimes we feel like we're in that pit and we have to look to the Lord to live. We have to get our eyes off the ordinary. We have to get our eyes off the, the earthly. And we need to lift up our eyes, look up and live. Sometimes it seems so ordinary in our schoolwork, in our vocational work, in our retirement, in our volunteer service. I met someone just recently who is just so tired of of restrictions and masks and, and distancing. And he said, if this is going to be life, I'm just not up for it. Just not up for it. So tired of not being able to be close and enjoying the fellowship with others in a close way. And yes, how beautiful we have phones. We have email and Zoom and YouTube. So many ways that we can connect but we long for that close fellowship and close connection to be together, to share a handshake, to share a hug, to sit with someone right beside them instead of that two yards, two meters away. The people of Israel became impatient on the way. And we become impatient, for sure. But we need to learn from God and learn from his word to look up and live and live to the fullest. Unfortunately, the people of Israel, they, they turned to sin in their impatience, in their discouragement. They called out and they asked, are we nearly there? And how many times we joke about that of kids in the back seat of the car, are we nearly there? Are we nearly there? We hardly get out the driveway and already the kids are asking, are we nearly there? The grandchildren, are we nearly there? One hour and two hours and three hours on the journey, are we nearly there? I remember as a kid, times going through the the Fraser Canyon and usually in the summer and it was hot. And I had an idea that in the next town, 
there was a Dairy Queen or a Tasty Freeze soft serve ice cream. And it seemed like eternity to get from one town to the next town. And I can hear my own voice echoing, are we nearly there? Are we nearly there? In Africa, the roads were so lousy so many times and potholes that would swallow our pickup truck. We would bounce over those bad roads on our way for ministry, which we knew was going to be so sweet to meet those congregations, to worship together and, and share the word of God together. But there were times when that road just seemed to be never ending. I would ask the person guiding me, are we nearly there? How far is it? And very often they would just do a, a movement of the chin and say, it's just there, just there. And we would wonder how far is just there. Sometimes they would say, just there, over that hill. And we'd reach that hill, and as we crested the hill, I would long to see that village and that church that we were going to. But very often, it was just more bush and more pothole road. I would say, are we nearly there? Just there, just there. And we would continue on. And sometimes life feels like that, that are we nearly there? Are we nearly there to our goals, to our, to our aspirations? Are we nearly there? And we become impatient on the way. Well, unfortunately, the people of God here in, in Numbers 21, the children of Israel, they asked, are we nearly there? They became impatient on the way. They were discouraged, and their discouragement led to sin. Their impatience led to sin in three very distinct ways. First, the people spoke against God. Verse 5, the people spoke against God. They had known him, they had walked with him, and they knew him even now, but they spoke against him. They complained against God. God himself, they grumbled. They had a better idea than God. They thought that they could do better. They were more interested in the things of life. They were more interested in today instead of the promise of God, instead of where God was taking them. They were not interested in the journey. They just wanted things to be accomplished right here and now. They didn't want to serve along the way, and they became discouraged. They spoke out against God. They sinned against God. Their souls were discouraged. And we know that scripture that what does it profit a person when they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? And how close they were to losing their own souls as they complained against God, they sinned against God. And then in that same verse, in verse 5, it says, they spoke against God and they also spoke against Moses, the very servant of God that God had given to lead them, to guide them, to counsel them, to help them, they spoke against Moses. They sinned against the servant of God. He represented God to them. He spoke God's word and God's wisdom to them. But they grumbled and they complained and they became bored with it. And they stopped listening to him. They stopped listening to God. They complained. They complained. They sinned against God. And they sinned against the servant of God. They sinned against Moses. But God loved them so much that he gave them Moses. He gave them Moses to call them out. He gave them Moses to counsel them. He gave them Moses to share God's word. How many times I have counseled someone and in their embarrassment over their sin, over their struggles, sometimes they call someone out. So-and-so spoke to me and and brought to light my, my problem, my sin, my issue. And I remind them that's how much God loves you, that God puts someone in your life to give you that counsel, to give you that guidance, to call you in love back to him. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God cares about you, that he sends these people into your life. But here was Israel complaining, complaining about God, and complaining 
about the one that God gave them. They complained about Moses. But then also, the third way they sinned, as we continue that verse, they complained against God and Moses, and they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt in, into this place, into this wilderness to die? For there is no food and no water. Of course they had food. Of course they had water. And then it continues, we loathe this worthless food. And so what they're saying is, we despise God's provision. We pray, oh God, give us our daily bread. And God gives us our daily bread. He sends quail in the wind and he drops manna from heaven. He gives water from the rock, but we hate it. We loathe this worthless food. Worthless food. The gift from God's hand. The provision from God. And they say, we loathe it. We're tired of it. We want something else. And it didn't matter what they wanted and what God gave them, they still wanted something else. So here is another way that they sinned. They sinned in despising God's provision. What God had given them in love, they despised. They despised it. We loathe. What a strong word. We hate what you have given us. God, you failed us. Moses, you failed us. And now look what we have here to eat. We loathe it. Previously, they've said, we have nothing to eat. We have nothing to drink. But in fact, they had something very special from God's hand. But they said, we loathe this worthless food. So their impatience, their discouragement, instead of going to God in a good way, instead of lifting their eyes up away from their circumstances, Instead, they complained, and their complaint led to sin, a threefold sin against God, against Moses, and against God's provision. As a kid, we didn't have a lot in our home, and mom and dad did take great care of us. We were always provided for. With five kids in the family, there were lots of hand-me-downs and all, and mom stretched the milk with powdered milk and water and all kinds of things, to make it work. She baked bread. And oh, the smell of fresh bread being baked. How beautiful. And we love that bread. But we'd hear from television about Wonder Bread, that what we really needed was Wonder Bread, not mom's good home baked, not the bread that mom was buying if she bought it in the store, but we needed something else. How discouraging it must have been for mom if she ever heard us talking about it, that we wanted Wonder Bread instead of homemade. How we'd enjoyed the homemade, and especially the day that bread was baked, was the best dessert going. Some preserves, some jam, homemade on that, on that bread. But isn't it often the way that we look for something else. We look for something that we think is better. I have been privileged to travel a lot and I've enjoyed the, the rich rye bread in, in Denmark and, and puri and in Singapore and roti and in Fiji. Thick, wonderful chapatis in, in Kenya and Tanzania. The simit sesame bread on the streets of Istanbul. And each of these breads, as I have enjoyed them, I think, my, this is what bread is supposed to be. Rosette in, in Rome. But I have learned, as I have prayed, give us this day, give me this day my daily bread, that I can enjoy rye, and I can enjoy a homemade bread, simit on the streets of Istanbul. But each time I need to give thanks. Not for what I don't have, but for what God has given me. And this was the problem with Israel. Instead of thanking God for what he had given them, they looked further and they looked around and imagined that they were missing something very special. The daily bread that you're giving us, O oh God, is not good enough. It's not right for me. Don't you think God knows better? Doesn't he know what's best for us today? And if it's a rye or a pumpernickel or a sourdough, 
And those of you that know Pastor George, you might have a line on some amazing sourdough right here in town. But whatever that bread is, give thanks for it. Don't get caught up in wanting something different than God's provision. So what is the result of their sin now? In verse 6, we see, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so many of the people of Israel died. How sad. How sad that their sin led to this punishment. How sad that they had, they had stirred such anger in the Lord in their threefold sin against him, against his servant, and against his provision. And he brought punishment. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, it says, The soul that sins will die. And their souls were discouraged, but their souls were sinning souls. And the Lord sent these fiery serpents. A judgment from God. Serpents, snakes. I don't use the word hate very often in my life. I certainly don't say it about people. I don't say it about food. But when it comes to snakes, yes, absolutely, I hate them. I don't like how they look. I don't like how they move. And dangerous snakes like these ones that slithered around and bit the Israelites. How horrible. And I have faced mambas, black mambas, and green mambas, and, and cobras, and every one of them that I ever saw, I hated. Like the people of Israel loathed the food that they were, that they were given. I loathe those serpents, those snakes. I could tell you many stories of meeting snakes along the way, sometimes on a footpath, sometimes even in a car as I'm passing by, and a big snake would come out of the, come out of the bush. I had a snake in my bathtub one time, snakes in the house, and every one of them I have hated, and I thank God for keeping me from any harm from any of those snakes. But sadly, only when God sent this judgment, when God sent this affliction, that's the time that they came to themselves. Remember the prodigal son. He was in rags, in poverty, eating pig food, and it was only at that time that he came to himself. And sometimes our trials, our troubles, they lead us to that place of confession where we look around and we recognize that we are sinning against God in our complaining, sinning against the people of God in our complaining, and sometimes sinning against God in our complaining about his provision. But verse 7 Punishment brought repentance and sorrow. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord, and we've spoken against you. They recognized their sin, how their discouragement had led to their sin, and they came finally with a true confession. And hope for any sinner begins with, Father, forgive me. Father, forgive me. They'd sinned directly against God. They were in his face. They knew better than God. But now they recognized that they were guilty and they confessed their sin. They confessed their sin against Moses and they got right with God. They got right with Moses and they got right within themselves. They got right with their attitudes, right with their heart. And they asked Moses in the rest of that verse, pray to the Lord that he takes away these serpents from us. Pray, pray. A few minutes ago, they had despised Moses. They despised God. But now they come to the servant that they had despised. And he became the intercessor. They came back as they they humbled themselves. And they came back and said, please pray for us. Be that intercessor for us. The one that they had persecuted, they now called on to pray. And what does Moses do? It says, so Moses prayed. So Moses prayed. Just as Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. As Stephen prayed, as he was being martyred, don't charge them with the sin. Moses prayed. Prayed for the people of God. He was not in discouragement. In verse 8, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. 
Anyone who is bitten can just look up and live. Taking their eyes off the natural and away from the earthly, looking up and living. You see, their eyes had been cast down. Their eyes were not recognizing the provision of God and the goodness of God and the grace of God. Their eyes were cast down instead of looking to God. And now God is saying, lift your eyes, look up, look up. And there was nothing special about that pole and nothing special about that serpent made of bronze on the pole. But it was an obedience, an act of faith to look up, look up and live. Salvation was a divine answer, divine provision, just as water and manna and quail had been a divine provision. Now this salvation was a divine provision. Look up and live. It was miraculous. Again, nothing to do with the serpent, nothing to do with the material, but look up and live. And verse 9, so Moses made a bronze serpent and he set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Those that looked down at their problems, those that looked at their bite, those that looked at their circumstances died. But those that looked up, that looked to God and his provision, were obedient. Those ones lived. We see the snake, the serpent, continues to be a medical symbol. And there are connections to Greek and Egyptian mythology, but also there's a connection to Numbers 21. When I think of snakes, I don't think about healing. I think about how to get away from them. And if I am bit, then how do I, how do I seek out healing? But this symbol became that symbol, look up, look up. And when we see that snake on a pole, we don't, or shouldn't at least, see a snake. We should see the miracle, the love, the grace of God. King Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 18, he had to deal with the people of Israel here because the people began to worship. They began to worship the, the serpent on that pole, the bronze serpent. They began to burn incense to it. And so he had to take it and he had to destroy it. Because now they were taking their eyes off God, and putting their eyes on a, on a serpent on a pole. And again, missing what God had done for them, missing the miraculous, missing the relationship, missing that care of God. The serpent of God was God's provision, God's answer for a time and for a place. And it was a symbol and a type of the salvation of the Lord and a type and a, and a shadow of Christ. The serpent had bitten, and now the serpent brought healing. From Adam, the first man, sin entered the world, and death entered the world. And then we find the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came and he took on the likeness of flesh, the likeness of man, and he came and said, look up and live. Isaiah 45 and verse 22, it says, look up, look to me and be saved. As we have just seen in Numbers, anyone, anyone who looks will live. Anyone, now we turn to the New Testament of John chapter 3, anyone who looks up to Jesus will live. John 3 and 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus later said that if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Nicodemus, who was a Jewish leader, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the council, the court, he came to Jesus one night, and Jesus spoke these words to him. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he began to explain to him, and just like Numbers 21, whoever, that's anyone, whoever believes, whoever looks to him, whoever, anyone 
who believes in him, anyone who looks to Jesus, should not perish but have eternal life. Anyone who looks will live. So we see the type and we see the provision. And again, we see the miraculous in God sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is his son given for the healing of all, for the healing of all mankind's sin. Jesus taking our place on the cross. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 15, Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He is stressing it to Nicodemus. That you want life, it's in me. And I must be lifted up. John 12 and 32, Jesus said, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Must be lifted up. Must be lifted up to the cross, and then lifted up from the grave, and then lifted up to the throne of God in heaven. If I be lifted up, I will bring life. I will draw all people to myself. I will bring life and the curse is removed. The penalty of sin and death is removed. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men, all people to myself. And then if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up in your life, if I be lifted up in the church, if I be lifted up in this world, lifted up in you, I will draw all people to myself. Look up and live. Look up and live. Yes, we're impatient along the way. Isolation, COVID, the economy, politics. Sometimes we are also discouraged and we just don't feel like we're thriving. But the Lord says, look up and live. Look to me and live. Look to me and live. Your sins are forgiven. Look to me and live and enjoy that abundant life in me. Remember your source is me. Don't sin against God. Don't sin against his servants. Don't sin against his provision. When you ask him, give me this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Enjoy the bread. Enjoy what God has given. And God will pour out more and more and more exciting things. Enjoy the gift that God has given you now and trust him for the future. Trust him for where he's taking you. Trust him on the journey. Trust his provision and give thanks for what he's given you today. Look up and live. And then lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher in your life. Lift Jesus higher in your testimony. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see, because he said, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to me. I'll draw all men unto me. One evening in Kampala, I was waiting for some students to come over to share together in worship and prayer and fellowship. I made coffee for the crowd that I was expecting, and while I was waiting, the lights flickered. They went on and off and flickered, and then finally they went off, and I lit the coal oil lanterns and put them around the house, and soon I could hear the students approaching, and the voices were excited. There was laughing, and very often they would clap their hands as they, as they exclaimed about something. And, and so the voices got louder and louder as they approached my door, and I opened, and, and the crowd came in. And they were laughing and shouting and, and rejoicing about something. So as soon as they came in, I said, tell me, tell me, what are you talking about? What happened? Oh, they said, you should have been there. You should have seen it. And, and I said, what? What was it? Oh, we passed by the marketplace on the way from the college. And as we passed by, we, we found some, uh, some people of another religion. And they were there in the marketplace and they were preaching. And they, they had a loud, a loud speaker system. 
And so they said, we saw that one electricity pole was, was leaning a bit and it was loose. And so we grabbed hold of that pole and, and we shook it and we shook it until the wires began to touch and, and, and then it shorted out the whole system and then the power went out and they didn't have any more loudspeakers. Didn't we do good? And they said, did you? And they said, but we silenced them. We silenced them. We stopped them from their preaching those wrong things. Anyway, I went over and I picked up my Bible and I, and I put it in front of them and I said, show me chapter and verse. And they said, what do you mean? And he said, where did the Lord tell you to go and shake the posts and, and turn off the power so that others couldn't share their messages? Show me where it is. And they kind of looked and looked at each other and a little embarrassed and, and they weren't really sure where I was going. And I said, you have one mission. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 32, he said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. It's not about you putting someone else down. It's not about you silencing someone else. It's about you lifting up the name of Jesus. It's about you exalting the Lord Jesus. It's about you sharing his name. It's about you preaching the truth of the gospel. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. You don't need to pull anyone else down, but lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. Because he said, if I am lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. There's your number one mission. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up in your own life when you're discouraged. Lift him up in your own life when you're impatient. Lift him up. Lift up your eyes. Look up and live. The secret to life is not in the stuff. It's not in the bread. The secret to life is in Jesus Christ. Look up and live. And as you lift up your eyes, lift Jesus up for others, for the world to see, and let everyone be drawn to him. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. There's a song that I used to love to sing in Africa. It begins, cast your burden unto Jesus, for he cares for you. And then it gets to the chorus, and then they begin to shout, and the hands go up. Higher, 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 lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. But today we're going to sing another beautiful song. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. For he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Amen. Jesus higher, lift him up, oh lift him up for the
And now the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. God bless you as you serve him this week.